Welcome to 7 Days of Science. Starting off the news this week, Google has published the results of a test of their quantum processor in the journal Nature. The company has been developing the Sycamore quantum processor for some time and has performed a task that took 3 minutes 20 seconds, as opposed to one of the world's best supercomputers which would complete the same task in 10,000 years. From this, Google has now claimed that they have quantum supremacy, which is a reference to the other companies which are currently trying to create a quantum computer. IBM have replied to this claim, saying that they can complete the same task in two and a half days with far greater fidelity, and that even this estimate is conservative. They have also challenged the very phrase quantum supremacy, saying that quantum and classical computers each have their own unique strengths. Starting off this week's paleontology news is the exciting report from this year's SVP in Australia that a particular fossil specimen that was retrieved from the ruins of Brazil's Museo Nacional has been examined and turns out to be the first evidence that pterosaurs lived in Antarctica during the Cretaceous period. When the museum burnt down last year, millions of all sorts of invaluable artefacts were damaged and destroyed. But now this fossil bone, along with another that was housed in a building which survived the fire, is still able to provide paleontologists with valuable scientific information, which is great news. The bones apparently either came from an Asdarkid or Pteranodontian, and shows for the first time that these reptiles were flying over Cretaceous Antarctic skies too. Of course, this land would have been much warmer in the Cretaceous than it is now. Before this discovery, there was a small pterosaur bone dated to the Jurassic known from Antarctica, but this new find now opens up the future possibilities of discovering more of these Cretaceous Age animals in this region. Next up, a fascinating bit of research was published this week that looked into how large-bodied dinosaurs managed to keep cool. It's important that these animals stop the sensitive organs in their heads from overheating, and through comparisons with living birds and other reptiles, the researchers were able to reconstruct the flow of blood through these extinct animals' heads to see how they cooled their brains by the evaporation of moisture in areas such as the mouth and nasal cavities. It was found that the various lineages of dinosaurs, which had all independently evolved big body size, solved the cooling problem in different ways, whereas smaller dinosaurs had similarly sized canals throughout their skulls, meaning there was a balanced blood supply since they didn't struggle to stay cool. Sauropods put an emphasis on the mouth and nasal cavity as regards to cooling down through evaporation with increased blood flow to these areas, and on the other hand, large ankylosaurs only emphasised the nasal cavity and big theropods had a totally different solution, cooling down to the use of a large air sinus in their skulls that would have been ventilated when they opened and closed their mouths. A fascinating bit of evolution in action. Finally, we have some very interesting news from the North Dakota Geological Survey's Paleontology Resource Protection Program. Some images have been released on their social media of one of the forelimbs of an Edmontosaurus specimen referred to as Dakota the Dino Mummy, an exceptionally well-preserved fossil that has been known about for a while, but recently it has been better prepared for a new exhibition. This incredible looking specimen appears to show what the NDGS is calling a weight-bearing hoof-like nail on digit 3, the lack of a thumb, a digit 2 with a spade-like nail, a digit 4 that is encased in the mitten of flesh, and a digit 5 with no nail and which is not included within the mitten. There is also some information on scale sizes and distribution, with smaller scales being present in areas of greater flexibility. This is definitely a very exciting specimen, and hopefully even more new discoveries can be made once it is more fully prepared and ready for display, and it seems as though it could potentially provide us with all sorts of useful new insights into the life appearance of hadrosaur dinosaurs. But what are your thoughts on this specimen and its interpretation? Thank you very much for watching this week's 7 Days of Science. I do hope you enjoyed it, and feel free to subscribe if you haven't already, and if you have, we'll see you on Sunday.